today to talk, uh, as Claudia introduced, about happiness and about why understanding consumer emotions, human emotions and happiness is important to us in market research. And um, I guess that there are kind of, that this is because as an industry we tend to view consumers as data points. I think we have a tendency to distance ourselves from consumers, uh, to think about them as data points. Um, and we need to understand and empathise with them and think about where it is that they're actually coming from. Today's brands are facing a new set of challenges. Consumers are uh, savvy, they're increasingly demanding about the brands that they use, about the expectations they have from the brands that they're dealing with. Um, and that means that brand loyalty has become eroded. And I think it was interesting earlier to hear peers talking about what does loyalty mean, uh, what is brand loyalty, and are people loyal at all, um, and that we need to be thinking about how we uh, understand consumers, understand their mindsets, uh, and think about actually what is important to consumers and how can we tap into that as an industry. So as consumers reevaluate the brands that they deal with, the services that they use, the expectations that they have from brands, we think it's time as an industry to reevaluate the relationship that we have with consumers um, to help brands meet these new challenges. So there are really three things that I want to try and convince you about today. Um, and that is that happiness matters to humans. Um, and because happiness matters to humans, it should matter to us as brands. Um, we should make people happy at the point that they're experiencing our product or service. And that positive emotions mean quicker habit formation. So I'll come on to talk about some work that we've done with academics uh, around happiness theory, around habit theory, uh, to demonstrate why those three things are important. But as I mentioned, as an industry, I think we have a tendency to view consumers as data points um, and to distance ourselves from our participants, from consumers, um, from our research respondents. We think about things like satisfaction, we talk about net promoter scores, we think about future purchase intent. These are all very rational measures. Um, and as humans, we're actually very emotional creatures, but we seem to kind of take that element away from research and revert to asking very rational questions. In addition, that's how businesses talk, that's not how people talk. So if you look on something like Facebook, people don't talk about whether they're satisfied. Um, oh, I was very satisfied recently when I had this experience. They talk about liking things or loving things or hating things or being happy or, or unhappy. And we need to mirror the sort of language that consumers use rather than just thinking about the language that's endemic in the businesses in which we work. In addition, loyal customers, while they are typically satisfied, um, satisfaction doesn't necessarily translate into loyalty. Um, so people who are satisfied may or may not go on to buy your product or service again. Uh, the two don't necessarily always follow each other. And people, as people, our decisions are shaped by habits, by context, uh, by the environments that we're in. We're not these rational creatures that always weigh up the costs and benefits of every decision we make. A lot of the time our decision making is based on emotion, it's based on very quick, intuitive thinking, or it's based on our habits, uh, which are kind of conscious decisions that we made at one point that have now become automatic decisions that we make on a regular basis. We talk a lot in the industry about emotion and the importance of understanding consumer emotions, but we don't necessarily follow through with it. We still use these very rational measures. Um, so I'm here today to try and convince you not to just think about satisfaction, not to just think about net promoter and these very rational ways of understanding customer effort, customer experience, customer journeys, customer decision making, um, but actually to think about using some more emotional metrics instead. We've forgotten, I think, that consumers are people just like we are, and we need to hold a mirror up to the language that they use and reflect the types of language, the types of words uh, that they use and that we use as consumers. So as I mentioned, there are three things I want to convince you about today. The first one is that happiness matters to humans. And because happiness matters to humans, it should matter to brands. And I'll talk you through some happiness theory uh, which we've uh, spent quite a lot of time looking at at Join the Dots, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, and the second thing I'm going to talk about is that we need to make people happy at the point that they're using or experiencing our brands or service. 
And that's because positive emotions drive quicker habit formation. So I'll talk you through some work we did in the UK with Manchester University Business School to understand if you could make people happy at the point that they're experiencing your brand, does that drive purchase intent uh, more effectively? And I'll also talk you through some habit theory around uh, whether, why positive emotions help to form habits. Because as I say, a lot of what we typically think of as loyalty within the industry isn't actually loyalty at all, it's just habits. So at Join the Dots, we became really interested in the idea of happiness theory. And some of you may have come across happiness theory uh, in various guises. Um, this is something we became very interested in to understand what motivates us as humans um, at that real basic level, what actually drives uh, human motivation. And this is the sort of thing that has been debated for thousands of years, right back to the time of the ancient Greeks, for example, Aristotle, Epicurus, uh, coming up with their own theories about people seeking to minimise painful experiences and maximise happy and uh, peaceful experiences. The discipline of psychology initially adopted similar thinking and over the last, particularly the last 100 years or so, those theories have evolved quite considerably through Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, into the latest incarnation, which is colloquially termed um, happiness theory, which is around positive psychology. One of the uh, leading um, proponents of positive psychology or happiness theory is a chap called Martin Seligman. Um, and we've become very interested in the work that he's doing and, and the theories that, that he's talking about. And there have been lots of attempts within happiness theory to understand what sits beneath that. So what are the key drivers of happiness um, that sit beneath this idea of, of happiness? And there have been lots of attempts to try and categorise it. Martin Seligman has his own version. He calls it the PERMA framework. Uh, the UK government, for example, has its own version, and the UK government actually have made happiness a core national statistic now, along with GDP uh, and other measures. And at Join the Dots, we've got our own version of the uh, drivers of happiness. So these are karma, uh, focus, success, relationships, and world. And these are the five aspects of people's lives, the five underlying drivers that people want to have great relationships with the people around them, a connection uh, with the wider world, uh, a feeling of success, things to focus around, um, and good karma as well, ultimately. Now, at the moment, these um, theories and these, these drivers have been developed um, very much um, in Europe, and we're looking to redevelop those at the moment across Asia. So I'm with my colleague today, actually, Andrea. Uh, give us a wave. Uh, who is our local trends consultant. She's been doing a lot of work over the last few months to look at how these are similar and different in different Asian markets. And we will be releasing a new version, a new improved version of this framework over the coming months, which is likely to be accompanied by a white paper as well. So hopefully we'll be able to share that with you soon. So we became interested in this idea that if happiness motivates us as humans, and there's lots of theory um, to suggest that it does, how can we apply that in a consumer landscape? We live in a capitalist society, we live in a consumer society. How does it apply uh, when it comes to consumerism? Is it something that, that kind of transcends? So we worked with um, Manchester Business School and a, a psychologist at Manchester Business School in the UK to understand happiness in relation to brands. Um, we did a study uh, with about 400 consumers in the UK. It was an in-the-moment study, so it's been interesting to hear Manny talking today about trying to get closer to those moments of truth and trying to understand consumers um, at a time and a place that is convenient to them when they're actually experiencing products and services. So we got a group of consumers, we asked them to download a mobile app for a four-week period, um, and we asked them to, in to engage with the app uh, every time they, um, they bought a new product or service, whether that was a product or service that they previously bought, so one that was familiar to them, or a brand new brand or, or product. And we asked them at these different times to tell us how happy they were feeling. And we used a number of different measures uh, within these surveys. We kept them short. They were all kind of five to seven minute surveys because we wanted to engage people over this period of time to keep coming back and engage with us within the app. 
And we asked them these questions. We also got some uh, measures of their sort of happiness at rest, so not in relation to a brand, product, or service. And we also asked people to upload some selfies. So we asked, we wondered whether could we use selfies as a measure of people's happiness, as well as asking them how happy they are with the brands uh, that they bought. Could we use selfies? Could that be a different measure uh, of happiness? The research was all done on their terms. So we asked them to take part in the survey when it was convenient to them, when they wanted to, when they were experiencing that brand, product or service, both when they bought it and both when they were actually using it so that we had those two different measures. Um, and it was important that we didn't dictate those terms because obviously we don't know what kind of day someone's going to be buying that brand or consuming that brand. So we had to cede some control to the consumers to take part on their own terms. And when it came to the analysis, uh, we found that happiness does indeed matter. So these are some of our participants uh, from the research and some of the selfies that they sent us. Uh, we had quite a lot of selfies to, to kind of go through as well as the data that we collected. Uh, and these are some of the people with the products and the, the, the brands that they bought. Whole range of different types of brands from laundry detergent through to perfume. Um, so some uh, across different uh, sectors. And again, we didn't specify what type of product it had to be. Um, but we got lots and lots of images back and lots of really great data. And we found that when we came to the analysis, those brands that made people happy at the time that they uh, were experiencing, at the time they were using those brands, correlated very highly with whether they were going to purchase those brands again. Interestingly, there was no correlation between how happy a brand made people at the point of purchase and whether they were going to buy it again. And that makes sense because at that point of purchase, you may not know whether you're going to buy that again. It all comes down to the experience of that brand. So that is a good predictor. There's a high correlation between people saying, I'm happy with this product at the time that I'm experiencing it, that I'm using it, and then being likely to buy that product again. So brands need to make people happy at the point that consumers are experiencing their product or service, because that's going to be a good predictor of whether they'll buy that product again. And as researchers, that means we need to get close to that moment of truth, that moment that consumers are using those brands, those products, those services, because that's going to tell us whether that experience is positive, negative, and whether they're likely to repeat it. And for the selfies, so that was from the question data that we asked people, for the selfies, they don't work as a measure of understanding happiness. Um, we actually wrote a white paper on this, on the selfies. If anybody's interested, there is an SMR paper that we wrote uh, with a bit more detail. But what we found with the selfies was that although we got lots of them back, and these are just a, a small selection, um, they have no relation to the data that we collected. And there's a number of reasons for that. Selfies are our kind of curated image. Uh, we have no idea how many people, how many times people took a selfie of themselves with the product or service um, before they actually uploaded it to the app. They may have taken five or ten to make sure that they were happy with it. Um, there's kind of a tendency for people to want to smile in photographs, even if that's not the emotion that they're really feeling about that product. Um, and also, with our sample, we weren't just talking to millennials. We did a, a kind of representative sample of different age groups. So there would be some people in there who are just not used to taking selfies. Um, so selfies are not a good measure of people's happiness, uh, so just be warned of that. They can add lots of colour to your findings, to your debriefs, and really help to bring things alive, but don't rely on them uh, as a measure of, of how happy people are when they're posing uh, with their products in those photographs. So if we can make people happy at the point that they're experiencing our brand uh, or our product, um, we can try and make them what we would call loyal uh, traditionally. We can make them uh, more likely to be repeat buyers of our product. And that's really exciting. Um, but what also matters is this idea of habits. And I mentioned up front that a lot of what we think of traditionally as loyalty isn't loyalty at all. It's actually habits. Um, and habits, they estimate, uh, so psychologists estimate that habits make up about 40% of the decisions that we make on a daily basis. Habits are automatic responses to cues, to stimulus in our environment that shape our decisions. 
Um, they, are, they are decisions that we've made consciously at one point in the past, but now they just become automatic. So if you think about uh, your routine on the way to work, you probably always go the same way to work. Maybe there are different ways you could go, but you have a habit of going the same way. If you think about your lunch, you may have a, a, a similar repertoire of different meals that you will have for your lunch, and you won't necessarily venture away from those. I think about myself, I always get a coffee from the train station in the morning on the way to work in Singapore. I don't even think about it, it's just a, an automatic response um, to walking past the coffee shop on the way into work. Um, and these they, they, habits make our lives easier because it means we don't have to consciously think about those decisions. So habits are really important for us to understand as researchers. Because if we are confusing this with loyalty, that has a big impact on the type of research that we do, on the analysis that we do, on our understanding of consumers. So we looked at the work of uh, a psychologist called B.J. Fogg, who's based at Stanford University in the US, and he talks a lot about habit theory. And his key idea about building habits is that if you experience a positive emotion, at the time you're doing a behaviour that you want to become habit or to become an automatic behaviour, experiencing that positive emotion is like a shortcut in your brain. It's a way of telling your brain this is an experience worth repeating. It feels positive. It's going to create that habit more quickly. If you're interested in finding out more about habits, um, he does an online programme um, that tens of thousands of people worldwide have taken part in called Tiny Habits. Um, everybody can sign up for it, it's, it's completely free. I tried it and it, it works for five days and he asks you to pick three small things that you want to become a habit. Um, so I tried it to see if it would work and, and it does, it does work. So my tiny habit, he says start with something really small. So he says if you want to get into a habit of running every day or going to the gym, that's quite a big thing to do if that's a change in your usual behaviour. So instead of saying, right, I'm going to go to the gym, he says, do something really small, break it down. Just put your trainers on, put your running shoes on, and then take them off again. Um, and do that every day until it becomes an automatic habit. And then maybe put your running gear on as well, or your gym gear, as well as your trainers. And then keep doing that until that becomes automatic. And eventually, hopefully, you'll end up actually going to the gym or actually going for a run. So it's about breaking it down into small parts. So I tried this, and... My tiny habit um, was that every time I went to the bathroom, I would do a little mini sun salutation like this. I'm not sure why I picked that. There was kind of no reason to pick that. Um, but we have to experience this positive emotion at the time that you're doing it. So every time I did this, every time I remembered, I would go, woo, and like, smile at myself in the mirror, um, which, also, which, which gave me a positive emotion. Also made me laugh a little bit more because I could see how stupid I looked in the mirror going, woo. Um, but really quickly, within a couple of days, it became an automatic response. Every time I went to the bathroom, I would do this afterwards and smile at myself and, uh, and have a little giggle uh, at myself. But it does work. It does work. And it became so automatic that I carried on doing this for months afterwards for no particular reason. It was of no benefit to me. Um, but the theory, it proves that the theory works. Um, so try it. Uh, maybe don't try that. Maybe try something that might actually be useful uh, for you to, to develop as a habit, but the theory works, the theory works. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, going back to this idea of the theory, I spoke to uh, uh, this uh, psychologist, uh, BJ Fogg at Stanford University, and I said, if this idea that people can experience a positive emotion at the time that they're trying to build a habit, if that's true, and I can kind of see that it is, because it's worked for me, can we apply that to people's usage of brands and products? And if we make them happy at the point that they're using those brands or products, will that drive habit formation more quickly? And he said, absolutely, yes. Um, and that was amazing. We've seen that, you know, if we can make people happy when they're using our brands, they're more likely to buy them again. But also, if we can make them happy at that point, it will drive habit formation more quickly. It will make them more likely to automatically think about and, and buy that brand in the future. And a couple of examples of this that I talked to him about, if you think about um, McDonald's um, and uh, buying a portion of fries in McDonald's, when you first buy, you know, you, you get your portion of fries, and when you have that first bite of the fry, it, it feels great. All these kind of neurons fire off in your brain, you get all of these positive emotions 
um, firing off in your brain and that's, that's telling your brain this is a good experience, this is something that I should repeat. Um, so McDonald's have got it right there with kind of, you know, making you feel good, making you have that positive experience. If you think about something like Virgin Airlines, when you first get on a Virgin Airlines flight, there's music, there's the kind of atmosphere, it's all kind of red and blue and, and purple and it feels quite cool and you think, yeah, this feels like a really positive experience. And note how the very beginning of that experience, in both of those examples, it's really important to get the beginning of that experience firing off those positive emotions for people. That's the sort of thing that will make them feel positive, happy, and will drive their habit formation more quickly and more likely to choose your brand again the next time. So in summary then, happiness matters to humans. Uh, it's been debated for thousands of years about what drives underlying human motivation. Happiness certainly does drive human motivation, but it also matters in consumer terms as well. And if you can make people happy at the point that they're using or experiencing your brand, your product, your service, um, they are more likely to say that they will buy that product again. And positive emotions, so it, making them experience that positive emotion at that point of consumption is likely to drive habit formation much more quickly as well. Um, and I think as researchers, um, there's a few lessons that we can take from this. It's, it's great to think about it, but what does that actually mean for us as researchers? How do we change the work that we do? Uh, what implications does it have? And I think there are a couple of key things for us as an industry. The first is that we need to get close to those moments, as I mentioned. We need to get close to those experiences that consumers are having with our brands. Um, you know, we need to get close to them in the moment rather than just sending them a survey later on or asking them, um, you know, what they did three weeks ago or three months ago when they can't actually remember and they're not experiencing that emotion because so much time has passed. We also need to understand the context um, that people operate in. So we need to think about their emotions. We don't just want to be thinking about these kind of rational things like satisfaction, for example. We need to understand how are they feeling and how does that impact on the decisions that they make um, and the, the purchases uh, and the products that they choose. And finally, we need to be thinking about measuring different things. So not just thinking about customer satisfaction, but thinking about how do we measure people's emotions? How do we capture their emotions and understand them? Because as hopefully I've demonstrated to you today, happiness can be a great predictor of future behavior, of driving habit formation. Um, and ultimately, happiness is what matters to people. So it should matter to us as brands and as an industry too. Thank you.